Ruiz. Welcome back to the next part of this Truth and Rhythm episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. Also become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you so much for your interest and support. Enjoy. Like I said, Gary Platt said to me one day, you know, Bo, one of these bands is going to pick you up. And I had done two albums in the studio with the Ohio Players by that point. And one day the phone rang and it was their business manager. And he said, would you be interested in doing some live dates in Europe and the Bahamas? Which and records did you do with them? You did Tenderness? And Tenderness and Ouch. And... Boardwalk uh, Records. Yeah, right. So... Um, David Johnson was the other keyboard player at that point. Billy was gone, um, and uh, uh, the phone rang. Would you be interested in doing some live dates in Europe and the Bahamas? And, of course, I'd played every bar and around UC and, you know, been there, done that. So I thought about that for about a 30th of a second and, and said yes. And I didn't really – in other words, I could do it for whatever was available and the enjoyment of doing it because I was developing my production business. So of course, a marketing strategy, there's that nasty word again, but a marketing strategy to all my out, you know, ad and corporate people was suddenly here I was visibly traveling and touring with a band that had gold and platinum records. So there was a novelty for them and wondering what that was like and talking about all those things. Um, but it was interesting because when I joined the band, there was the obvious lines of a song to cover. But early on, Sugarfoot, Foots just came to me and said, you be you. And I go, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, you be you. So I would go out and we would do the Ohio player songs and I would cover the main lines. But I had the latitude to do whatever I did whenever I was doing what I was doing, because that point, you know, I, I was, you know, doing whatever I did, stopping to qualify that. Let's understand who I learned the funk from. Okay. Junie Morrison. Bootsy Collins. Bernie Worrell. Keith Harrison from the Daz Band. Um, okay, and, and many others along the way, but th those are, you know, prominent. Bo Watson from Midnight Star. Um, so if, if you couldn't learn something from those people, you need to be just put out with, the, you know, in the, in the pasture on the other side of the fence. So, you know, and, and, and I got to learn from them, not only listen, I mean, it wasn't like I had to listen to record to learn their part. I watched what they did. I watched what they have me do. I, I watched what they let me do. Uh, I was able to do what they taught me to do, which let me continue to do whatever it was that I did. If that did, did, you, did, did Junie give you any advice since he preceded Billy as their keyboard player? <laughs> I went to his house one day and said, hey, Scoon, I'm in the players. And he just bust out. He had this laugh that was a cackle and a laugh, which we, we did with each other many a times. Because as I mentioned, we were both programming pre-MIDI, pre-computer, pre-everything in gear that had a volatile memory, which meant 
if you had programmed all this stuff and you could be spending hours or days programming a song, and if you lost the power, you lost everything in the memory, so it was volatile. And we were probably the only two that could have, you know, I could call him and go, hey, Scoon, I just lost all my memory. And he would just bust out in hysteria and start cackling over the phone. <laughs> and while it didn't fix it, it made it feel better <laughs> that you could at least recreate what you'd been working on for the last day and a half, you know? And he could call me and go, oh man, I just lost my memory and I just bust out laughing. And, and it was a laughing with, not laughing at, you know? And, and Commiserate. Was, yeah, we, we could mutually commiserate uh, with each other ab about that. So yeah, you know, I mean, those guys were all geniuses, you know? What, what, and, go ahead. Well, I wanted to ask you, what can you tell us about Sugarfoot? Because, you know, in these circles, he's considered one of the all-time greats also. Well, he's considered one of the all-time greats because he is one of the all-time greats, you know. Um, uh, had a great relationship with Foot. I uh, spent many a night after a gig sitting in the back compartment of the bus, just sitting and talking until seven or eight in the morning with Foots about all kinds of things. And I had a standing joke with him, you know, a couple of years after that when I'm seeing him, I'd say, hey, man, if I give you a quarter, will you call me up? And he would just bust out laughing because he would never reach out to anybody about anything or do. And it was like, and that was OK, because I didn't expect him to. But like I said, he gave me the complete latitude by the authorization of UBU. Uh, at all our live gigs and it was like well okay i think i know what you mean i'm not sure what you mean but i'll be me and 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 away we went you know and uh one day he said to me because you know bands have their shares of, of ups and downs and many wonderful things and one day um we had an issue where the bus left us and we and he looked at me one day we're sitting there talking and he goes wes why are you still with me? We started out flying and we ended up walking and I, we just started laughing. And I said, well, you know, it just seemed to be the thing to do at the time. And we just had this big hysterical laugh over that. Um, that was a great time for me because uh, it started with David Johnson. And David Johnson had a master's from USC. So he had this wonderful California jazz vocabulary. And I said a couple times to others, if I ever had the chance to work with David, I'd like to do that. And I did. And then the time came that um, they stopped bringing David and they brought some others in from Dayton. So there was a couple gigs that Billy Beck played with us on. And what a treat it was for me to do a gig with Billy. Also know? classically trained, I believe. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, classically trained had that church gospel vocabulary. And that's what foot, what you know, it's, I did not have that church gospel vocabulary. Billy did. And Foots was never really comfortable without that church gospel vocabulary. David didn't have it. I didn't have it. Uh, I didn't realize that's what he missed or I'd have tried to develop perhaps. But, um, and then uh, there was a series that, uh, um, Keith Harrison, who had been with Heatwave and was just transitioning to the Daz band, went out and did some dates. And so Keith and I had a great time playing these dates as well. Was he also a son or just those two? Oh, you're talking history now. He might have, you know, it's, I honestly don't know because I didn't realize that Sean Sandridge from Dayton was in Sun. Sun was a band that By Byron Bird recorded out at Counterpart. And I first met Sun and Byron and their manager, Bo Ray Fleming, out at Counterpart. Um, so again, understand that I only met everybody from the moment we all walked in the studio together and didn't really, um, foolishly on my part, I guess, didn't really research to see who was where or what they had done before. Well, that's part of the reason why it's so fascinating to hear your takes because you didn't have preconceived notions. You know, you just 
took them at face value as they came into that environment. Well, yeah, you know, and, and again, my goal was not to criticize or evaluate or do anything. My goal was, what are you recording? What are we looking for? What can we do to make it what you want it to be? And, and never really tried. In other words, I had my own musical outlets, so I didn't need to inflect any or interject any musical opinion unless asked. Of course, I always had an opinion. And if they would ask me, I would, you know, without crossing the line, volunteer an opinion. But I was never one to first offer an opinion because that was not my place. Did, did you get to meet Roger Troutman? Oh, Roger. Wow, wow, wow. Oh, Lord, what a tremendous loss. Interesting. Very particular, very demanding, very, I mean, they, you know, God bless him. Used to make me so damn mad sometimes that I couldn't see straight just because sometimes the, the, the fifth floor recording was fifth floor recording because, as you may surmise, it was on the fifth floor of this old building. And I'd get there and I'd have to schlep all my gear up five flights of steps and they would get there with their tapes and they'd have trunks full of tapes and they'd want every tape brought up. And it's like, Roger, why do you want every tape up? Well, we're not sure what we're gonna work on. And as deliberate and specific and methodical as he was, I'm standing there thinking, having slept up five flights of stairs with these cases of, you know, it was like, well, you knew damn well what you were gonna work on because that's what we did. And that's what we did the whole time. Um, very, very special. Um, different ranges of the Moog would behave differently enough that if you're listening very carefully, you can hear where an adjustment might be needed with the cutoff or the filter as you tracked up and down the keyboard. And I'd say this is especially in the case of when he was doing his talk box. And I can remember sitting there and he trusted me enough to make the adjustment on the cutoff or the filter as he was doing his, uh, you know. Vocals through. Yeah, vocals through the talk box with his brother, Terry, who was Zap, giving him, you know, the, the cue as to where he was. Uh, I remember, you know, shake it baby and he was rocking the baby shake it shake it mama he did you know like breast and then shake it shake it baby in the studio he was he yeah. was doing that yeah you know to because you know we're in the vamp and we're keeping track of things and and uh uh but wow roger was really really something special we uh, I probably cannot say enough about the tremendous loss, the loss of Roger Troutman. Mm -hmm. Arduous taskmaster. He was hard on his brothers and others in the studio, but that's okay. The, the, the result was well worth it. But uh, very well prepared. Very, I mean, just uh, another of the geniuses, just genius. Yeah, it seems like that was going around that part of the country. A lot of geniuses. Well, it was interesting, you know. Um, and, and again, you know, uh, it was Gary Platt that made the mention to me one day, you know, Bo, you're the only one that has carte blanche to come and go freely through all these sessions. And, I, you know, may, maybe I'm gullible, maybe I'm naive, maybe I, you know, I don't stop to think of the ramifications. I just wanted to go to work. And I wanted to be in the studio every day. And I was only trying to do everything I could to go to the studio every day and record every single day. And to be able to come and go and work with all those people was, was really a wonderful thing. You mentioned George Clinton earlier, and I want to get back to that in terms of, you know, what was it like when you first met him? What did you think of him? And uh, do you have any George Clinton stories? Well, when I went to Detroit, there was a hierarchy within PFUNK. I, I mean, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know how to describe it other than that, okay? And what I mean by that was Bootsy and George were at a hotel downtown and 
the rest of us were in a hotel right across the street from United. And certain ones of us were on the second floor and certain ones of us were on the first floor. And, and I don't know why or why not, you know? I mean, again, not being an actual part of P-Funk, I witnessed the hierarchy and there were two rooms at United and they were going on 24 hours a day and everybody would have these tracks bubbling, bubbling, bubbling like a cauldron and George would come in and stir the pot. So, you know, the term was extremely accurate, you know, the, the lid, if the lid blew off the pot, it would tear the roof off the sucker, you know. So the cauldron would already be bubbling and George would walk in and stir the pot. Exception to that rule, exception to that rule was Junie, who always recorded by himself. And I would pack my gear up and go over to Superdisc and record whatever tracks Junie was doing with Junie and then go back over to United and continue working on whatever the projects might have been. And, and doing songs and doing tracks, we, we always did more than what we needed. And I never knew really where something was gonna turn up. Meaning, you know, we could, I could go in with Bootsy and he would have me do a track and we could do something. And then George would be there. And then maybe Bernie would come, come in, but maybe it wouldn't be on, on a P-Funk record. So working with George and with Bootsy, you'd be doing these tracks. And I remember some of these tracks ending up maybe on Gary Scheider's album, or maybe ending up on Maceo Parker's album or maybe ending up, I, I don't know where, or maybe, you know, turning up a couple of years later. Um, and, you know, I mean, it didn't matter because, you know, they were always very good about credit and appropriate shares and, and sharing what was doing proper in all those situations. So there was never a trust issue, never an anything issue. And, you know, um, always, always had a, you know, I mean, what a blessing to be able to work with Genius musicians making wonderful records. And you did you know any of the guys from Slave? Because I know on that one George Clinton you mentioned your first go with that shake, Steve Washington, who had been with Slave, I know was involved with that project. So yes, and I don't remember um through Facebook, one of the fellows, and I even forget who reached out to me and you know, and, and we friended each other and he messaged me and said, oh, I just wanted to thank you for all you did with us in the studio. It was like, well, you're you're welcome. You know, the pleasure was all mine, believe me, you know, because um there was a frustrating moment, and you may choose to edit this out or not, but I'll share it with you because there's very few frustrating moments. One of which was the Ouch album, where I guess Richard Dimples Fields was the producer, and they took Foots to LA and did uh, the vocals, but nothing else. And it was like, um, at that point in time, when we were traveling and we were on the road, we had a station in Cincinnati that was our R&B PlayStation called WBLZ. And at that point in time, just by happenstance, I was averaging having worked on four of six songs in rotation, which is, you know, pretty daggone good average. And, you know, I mean, it, it, it wasn't something I was looking to do. It was just something I was going to work every day, making records with great people who were making these records and was frustrating that since I was there in and around and through everybody else, one would have thought the Dimples would have had me come and work with him on our own record, but he didn't. And it was like, oh, well, whatever, you know. Um, and like I said, feel free to edit that out. That's just. Well, do you think that was an ego thing or just an oversight? Who knows? You know, who, who knows? Hmm. Um, I learned an interesting thing about the, the players at that point in time. Uh, in that there were key ingredients that I felt, it was personal opinion, um, that there's a new band now with Diamond and Billy and, and Chet. And, well, Shadow. 
uh, yeah. Well, I didn't really want to be in the players. I, I wanted to be in shadow. And, and I had been talking with Diamond and Billy and Chet about when they went live to do some covering of it. And, and it never came to pass. And then the players called me. But I realized that, that for the players to be players, an interesting ingredient was they needed two or three of the three. Meaning you needed Foots and you needed Billy and Diamond. Or you needed Foots and you needed Junie and Diamond or you needed Foots and at least Junie or at least Billy or at least Diamond. Uh, you know, there was a combination. Uh, similar, I think, to George, Bootsy, Bernie, and Junie with P-Funk. Well, uh, you know, I because I was never actually live with them, I'd never stop to dissect it the way I had with the players because, you know, when you're, flying around and, or in driving around on a super eagle tour bus, you got time to think about all kinds of things. And um, I just, you know, I wanted everyone that I was working with to be the best they could possibly be, whatever that means, you know? And my goal was to just always help them do that. You know, in doing this show, uh, one of my frustrations is those that we lost before I started doing these in 2017 and among those are the Wilder brothers who you mentioned with Heat Wave. So um, is there anything you could share with viewers about uh, Johnny or Keith and the Wilders and, and the Heat Wave? Well, again, what a wonderful thing. Um, unfortunately, when we started working with Giant, Johnny, he had already had his accident. So he was, you know, paralyzed and came in in a mechanized wheelchair and he could still sing, but it wasn't the Johnny of pre-accident. And, uh, you know, but what they were doing was wonderful. They certainly had that talent. And I remember when I was traveling with Keith Harrison talking about Heat Wave and the, the whole Rod Temperton era of Heat Wave, which I never got to meet Rod, but was certainly a, a fan of that era of heat wave and everything. great songwriter yeah oh yeah you know and keith and i talking about well he talked to rod and rod you know if, if keith had a deal rod would do a song but he wouldn't write him a song to get him a deal and some criteria like that and you know when you're traveling with other keyboard players you've got all kinds of time to, to just really you know chit chat about all kinds of things you know so we but yeah, it was great working with, 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 with the Wilders. Great. Yeah, what a tragedy with um, uh, Johnny, for sure. He was one of the great vocalists of, of that era, um, at least on the R&B side. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, always and forever will remain uh, just a, a really wonderful song. The, the yeah. Title, the title says it, always and forever. Yeah, that was when I was in high school going to all the dances and parties. And so it was a major part of my life. Um, what about um, you uh, uh, have a credit for Pieces of a Dream? And I had, they were on the show a, a while back. Um, do you remember that project? Yeah, I do. Uh, Reggie Calloway. Uh, oh, Midnight Star Connection. Yeah, what, you know, uh, what an outstanding group of people they are. And I, I look back now, you know, th this just dawned on me a couple of years ago. Um, I played the string line on Slow Jam. And, nice. and I thought about that all these years later, going, wait a minute, you know, Reggie Calloway was kind enough to have me do that. And he no more needed me to do that than the man in the moon, but he did. And I thought it was such a gentlemanly thing to do. I didn't realize that at the time, but I look back 30, 40 years later and go, wow, what a gentlemanly thing to do. Same with what he had me do on Pieces of a Dream. He was producing their track and he came down to our studio and said, I'm looking for this and that. And, the, and, and that's what I did. And that was that credit. So again, Reggie Calloway, 
Um, I'd been working with his brother, Sino. We did a whole jazz instrumental album. We spent every Tuesday for six or eight months doing these tracks. Um, that was his instrumental album. Uh, and uh, uh, they were great to work with, you know, very picky. And then over the years after that, on some of my projects, um, for, for a number of years, I did all the broadcast and travel videos for the Sandals resort chain um, chains and beaches resort chains and, 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 and projects of that nature. And, you know, I used to have Belinda Lipscomb and, and, and Mudbone, Gary Cooper, uh, come and sing on my projects for me. You know, it's like, what a wonderful thing, you know, to be able wow. to you know, hey, uh, come on out, y'all. We're gonna we're gonna hit it this afternoon, and and you know, Mud Mudbone is such a unique sounding vocalist. Oh, wonderful! Uh, well, uh, and again, what a positive and influential, you know, uplifting person. You're great, just a great guy. Great guy. He's another guy who doesn't look like he's aged that much. You know, he's still out there doing it. Oh. Uh, the age factor of some of these guys is just so annoying. You know, <laughs> you know I look like an old great grandpa, you know, but I, I don't, you know, it is what it is. I don't, I don't think of anything, you know, it, the time is a relative thing, but yeah, bone, bone is great. Um, Belinda, I had so much fun a couple of three years ago. Uh, a friend of mine, Bobby Fisher, uh, teaches at a high school. And he had Midnight Star come and play for the kids. And uh, he had me come down to visit as well. And they were kind enough to let me sit in with him. And that was, that was a lot of fun, you know. Um, I got to play with, you know, practice with Junie every day. So it was almost like playing live with Junie. I never got to play live with Bootsy and wished I could have done that. Uh, you know, I mean, some of these groups just just for the sake of you spend so much time in the studio that, you know, there's a there's a different situation when you're playing live. Uh, so, you know, when they were kind enough to let me sit in with them for a few songs at the high school, that was a wonderful thing and just a lot of fun. You know, it's it's kind of if there's a bucket list, uh, you know, now the boots quit playing live uh, as such, you know, that'll know. But, you know, I mean. Uh, there was always a standing joke with him. Uh, bet you ain't got words. I'd be going by and he'd come out of the control room and go, hey, Wes, come, you got your whatever? And I go, yeah. You got your vocoder? Yeah. Well, bring it in here. And and he'd be sitting there with Rob and Jenny. He would be the engineer at that, and looking for a track. And there was a standing joke. Bet you ain't got one track, you know, and and, and I could still send him a text from time to time and just go, bet you ain't got one track. And he knows exactly what I'm making reference to. And, uh, you know, All these, I, like, these inside jokes, they're funny how they uh, develop, you know? Yeah. Well, we, because we ended up patching, you know, we ended up, I, we, I'll tell you how silly it gets. We only had 24 tracks, not 25, not 28, not unlimited like Pro Tools, 24 tracks. So we ended up punching in the vocoder on the hi-hat track at certain moments to whereas when that song was being mixed, they would roll that far, they would stop, they would then reset and go the next part. And then the, the master would have to be stopped and edited together where we had to stop and move forward and stop and move forward, you know, cause you did what you had to do. So literally it's bet you ain't got one track and, and that was it, you know, there wasn't one, but we'd find one. And uh, you were a popular guy when you came up with it, I'm sure. Well, you know, the, he came up with that one. I just was a bystander. You no, know? I mean, when you, when you provided what was, being asked is what i'm saying oh, when you yeah. came up with that one more track yeah. yeah yeah um and lakeside you had some work with those guys uh just in passing at fifth floor i don't know it's, I, I i have nothing as much memorable floyd bailey who was the the drummer in the players uh when i was in the players uh, had played with lakeside 
and we crossed you know paths but there was there was nothing i shouldn't say i don't remember them because i distinctly i mean they're great you know but but it wasn't months at a time like with so many others if that makes any sense do you have any other memories related to any of these great funk acts or funketeers that you want to share that we haven't touched on uh let's see the group dayton was a very interesting band to work with especially after the first album or two they started bringing in dr yasha barjona he was known as ronnie p harris back then but he's goes by ronnie song now and uh, Dr. Yasha Barjona is his name now, and Ronnie Song is what he goes by, and wrote some of the happiest, most uplifting music. They had a song called Sound of Music that I could just listen to over and over and over. Um, uh, again, another really, uh, Sean and Debbie Sandrich and, and Ronnie Song, uh, uh, we were doing a remake of of uh hot fun in the summertime yeah and uh they gave me i mean understand the fact that i recorded something didn't necessarily mean that i would get credit for recording it you know because everybody always gave me credits as being a synth programmer but they gave me engineering credit on that and it got to be a number 16 record so uh i thought it was extremely kind of them uh, to do that but then they were extremely i mean you know it was an interesting phenomenon because they started recording in california for you know a couple weeks at a time and and uh, they would take me along out there i mean they could have had mike bodiker or anybody out there but they would always take me along and uh you know i got to record all those records with them in fact ronnie called me a couple of three weeks ago and sent me some examples of, of a gospel project he's working on that he wants me to come to Hartford and work with him on. So um, you just never know. In other words, I don't do what I did every single day now. In 2010, I elevated myself to my own level of incompetency and in broadcast management. And in 2010, I became the head of programming and production for the Telos Alternative Health Channel, which was an alternative health and mind, body, and spirit television network and i did that from 2010 to 2014 and um i would tease people when i signed their programming that if i liked you i'll do your opening theme and of course that was um, you know uh, i'm easy all you got to do is ask me and i'll do whatever but i had done maybe 14 opening themes of the programming and i had done all the interstitial it's all the all the promos, all the interstitials, all the bumpers, everything going to and from. I'd done the music too for the network, and I'd have been happy to do that in years bygone. But because I had become an executive producer, I'd produced seven of the weekly episodic series that we were doing, and you know we were signing you know talent to the network. Music was my fun escape, but it wasn't my daily focus. And then when that stopped uh uh along the way and that i had become a board member to uh a, a an independent member of a board of, of a group that held several broadcast stations so my interest in broadcast and broadcast management uh, sort of took over um uh, corresponding with the end of our nbc series passions which i guess i probably should talk about that for a second because after the after the funk um i had a, a longtime friend and competitor that was in my electronic music class in college and in 1985 the recording market had started to subside in cincinnati and i was doing a lot of commercial and corporate work and my longtime friend and competitor and i merged our businesses in 1985 and in 1986, we started writing for television. And it started with As the World Turns, and very shortly thereafter included Another World and, and Guiding Light. Um, and then a couple of years after that, we started doing Lifestyles and Runaways of the Rich and Famous. 
And then our administrative partner, Ed O'Donnell, was insightful and, and uh, a visionary enough to uh, have us produce libraries that we distributed to over 400 independent music producers, you know, uh, um, music supervisors. So we had music appearing in all kinds of things for a number of years. How, 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 did, how, how did you know what type of music to bring to those projects? that would make the producers happy? Well, that's a very interesting question. I would understand that we had been doing corporate music and advertising scoring. And um, I love this, strange as it may seem, I love doing toy spots because toy spots were musically very, very innovative and very out of the box and over the top. And you could get by doing wonderful wonderful things in a toy spot okay um so you know you you learn to follow a script you learn to capture a mood you learn to work in an environment that's decision by committee and you learn before you present to the committee that well if they want this we'll do that if they want that we'll do this and just in case they're not thinking this or that, let's let's have this and something else that we can show them some options. That way they don't have to look anywhere else. So we had we had done Procter and Gamble's sesquicentennial film score, which was um, their 150 year PNG's 150 year celebration, and. Again, Ed O'Donnell, our administrative partner, had uh, John Henry Kreitler. John Henry was my creative partner, and Ed was our administrative partner. And after that sesquicentennial film score, we did uh, commemorative cassettes. Remember when there used to be a thing called a cassette? Mm -hmm. uh, we did commemorative cassettes and distributed them to all the top executives of P&G just as a commemorative. And one of them somehow found its way to New York. And Jill Diamond, the head of PNG Productions, called and said, I've got this cassette. It's wonderful. Did you guys do this music? And was, well, yes, we did. And, um, you know, started, you know, in, with the invitation to write for them. You, you, you learn music in that environment exists in a library by emotional category. So in learning to do that type of compositional craft, something needs, a piece of music needs to grow and develop and progress without having a change or an emotional quality or anything chain, or just not like a bridge or not like a lift or not like a verse chorus. It grows and develops. So you learn to through compose on a piece of music that has to typically be about a minimum of three minutes because you never know. In other words, I've scored many a projects, but daytime TV does typically an average of 265 episodes a year, which is a lot. And there's no time for post score. You, you have time. Now, if there was something special, they would call and say, hey, we're going to be doing this and it's going to be shot here and we're going to do that and we're going to need whatever the need was and again we would put our heads together and go well if they shoot it this way it's going to be like this if they shoot it that way it's going to be like that and we give them choices so you always give choices so they have whatever their need because the time that the music producer is posting the picture is not the time for them to be stuck just like you know bringing every keyboard you had to the sessions or yeah. you know coming up with extra tracks the same thing you got to be like a jackknife of all trades, right? And right, right. Be, be a prepared Eagle Scout. Uh, right, for, exactly. Yeah. So, so then in 1999, in 98, NBC took Another World off the air, which was tragic. And they came on board and online in 1999 with their own series called Passions. And Passions was like the dream of a lifetime. Uh, getting over the initial panic of my partner John and I left for California with 200 cues under our arm in April, knowing that we were going to air on the 5th of July, and we had to start writing relentlessly cues and recording cues for the music department to have. And 
that was the first show. In other words, Guiding Light, Another World, As the World Turns, as was Lifestyles and Runaways, we were contributing to an existing library. Now, we were aggressive enough with our business model to know that in order to have a major percentage of a library and capture a majority, majority of the use, we had to contribute a majority. So we made sure we did that relatively quickly and established ourselves as, as a resource. You know, all we were doing, we're part, we're part of a whole. And we just not like a band with a hit record with a front man with a whatever we were contributing to part of a whole and we made it our goal to be a very reliable resource and i guess let's see five for guiding light one for another world didn't get any i'm talking emmys and then um underscore for passion song of the year with passions and then a project that I had done called Tales for the Pet Lover's Heart, four plus two, that was sponsored multi-regionally by Kroger and, and Priorina. So my partner- Nine, nine Emmys. Yeah. Uh, what, how'd you feel when you won the first one? Absolutely stunned. In other words, we had, no, you know, my partner and I still had a studio in downtown Cincinnati. And we were, and John came into my co compositional room and said, We've just been nominated for an Emmy. And I looked back at him and he looked back at me. And we were kind of an Emmy. What does this mean? And we honestly didn't know. And we just went, the two of us, to the ceremony, you know, not thinking anything was, you know, I mean, I, you know, you, you, you don't know. So then we went and the first one and, and we actually won. And, you know, we didn't take our wives with us. We didn't take our partner with us. We didn't take anything with us. So, you know, it was, it, it was a monumentally uneventful event in that, you know, it was significant. So then we learned the next time and our wives went along and, you know, we dressed up a little better and continued the case. And then the beautiful, the beautiful thing about the Emmys was being BMI riders, if you win an award, BMI gives you an award for winning award, for winning an award. So every May, we went to California to a wonderful black tie event at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel that had, you know, so many, you know, I mean, musical heroes, John Williams, uh, Hans Zimmer. Uh, in television, Mike Post, and, you know, being a Yes fan, you know, Trevor Rabin, and Skunk Baxter, and, and you know, Mark Mothersbaugh, and, and everybody, and you would meet them, and you would win awards, and you'd be on stage, BMI always did a family picture at the end with everybody that won an award, they'd take a picture of that year, and publish it in their magazine, so those were really special times. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, and was there anything, uh, Wes, that you pulled on from your funk, uh, you know, era that, uh, helped you in anything you did later on, like any of the, you know, TV composing or. Well, the funk became such an ingra uh, ingrained, in other words, once I embraced the funk it was me and i was he if you if that makes any sense at all because i had been infused with the gift from the one like bootsy says and what i got to do flowed through me and it doesn't, um, you know, I don't do as gracefully as I once, once did. You know, it was like when he called me from Atlanta, I guess, uh, Power of the One, and said, hey, man, you know, I'm going to send you a clip. And then I looked at this clip and he goes, can you do me a track that I can, I can play along? And, of course, I hadn't been doing that in a while. So I started 
and I was just having fun. Well, how about this? Well, how about this? And how about this? And I went to have a meeting with Patty and Patty said, I don't know what you've been seeing. She said, I've never seen my husband so lit up in years. He was, he's just, what's your sending and just keep sending because he's having a wonderful time. And uh, a couple of things transpired from that Bootsy off Broadway and club Funketeers. And um, just this past spring out of the clear blue, Patty called me and goes, yeah, they've taken club Funketeers and done a new one called hip hop lollipop. Oh yeah, and, and you know she sent me the video and told me what it was and it was being used for so um the problem i have in doing what i did is i think everyone would still like me to do what i did and i would like to do what i did but new gear doesn't let me do what i did as gracefully as i did what i did when i had my first set of gear you know if I could go to the storage bin and bring it all out and set it all up and have it work, which is, you know, a whole other thing. I still have a, I want to build a studio one more time and I want to send all my analog gear away and get it repaired. And I want to go to Sweetwater and get everything that I don't have for the last 10 years, just because, and I want to set up my Hammond organ collection right next to me and hope to have some time to go in and do some things. Uh, how long have you uh, lived there in Kentucky? Since 2007. 2007. And I had wanted and I had wanted to build a studio, but I ended up building a horse barn and then I ended up doing this and doing that and then working in TV. So um, it wasn't like when I was making records every day. You know, it was making records every day was a different thing. Writing cues every day was a different thing. Um, whereas business and contract negotiation is a different thing as well and it's not the same skill set as i was using when i was you know playing every day and night i mean i could still do it but not as gracefully as as what i once was as, as you look back wes on that period in the late 70s to mid 80s with funk music are there two or three uh, tracks that you were associated with that you feel most proud of or are your favorites? Oh, man, that's a rough one because uh, how lucky am I to say that I got, you know, I was chosen to get to participate in so many wonderful pieces of music. I mean, I almost have to stop and think, you know, with Junie, um, I'm thinking on bread alone. I'm thinking love has taken me out. That was, um, that's a great one. That's a great one. Um, with Bootsy, you know, Body Slam and uh, everything off of the, the, the count, you know, the count, the, the one giveth. There was just some fun. One of the most amazing things I ever got to see was Fred Wesley, Chris Griffin, Larry Hatcher, and Maceo. The Horn, original Horny Horns. Doing a horn session. And here's what I saw. They came in. Chris Griffith had 103 temperature that day. And They'd roll the track and they'd, and they'd stop and Fred would go, okay, we ought to do something like, and they'd go, okay. And then they'd all play it back in harmonies in the, and I'm going, are you kidding me? Think and it that's and it execute it. Yeah. Yeah, and it was like roll tape, bang, there it is. And it was like, wow, that that's something that you don't see like ever, let alone any day. So that's a monumental thing. Um, let's see, Junie, Bootsy, uh, Dayton, The Sound of Music, and several of those songs from that era. Roger and Zap, Grapevine. Uh, uh, dance floor, uh, midnight star, of course, freakazoid, slow jam, 
no parking on the dance floor. Um, Ohio players, ten, the tenderness, uh, try a little tenderness. And another one called Skinny, you, you know, um, I you know, don't believe. You know, track I liked off that album, and I don't know if you had, were there for it, but it was uh, Boardwalking. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I, w I was there for that. Um, when we were playing live, when I was given the free hand to be me, I guess the funk had infused me uh, or I had been infused by that period of time because um, I'm not a racial person. I don't believe, you know, they're, they're, you know that's something that in this, by now we should not be dealing with. I saw what it was like firsthand when I was on the Ohio Players Tour bus. And in 1980, I thought it was absolutely, uh, I never saw anything more uncalled for uh, as what I saw several times. And I remember, you know, you mentioned Sugarfoot, what it was like. Foots was great. One time we're, we're driving and he stood up on the bus and goes, remember y'all, we're in Mississippi. So if we gets pulled over by the police, we all work for Wes. And everybody just, and it was kind of like, what, a, you know, yeah, we, we thought the, it was funny. The, yeah, the, the unfunny thing is there's some truth to it. That's the scary part. Well, yeah, that was, you know, but in other words, you can hear about it, but unless you've experienced it, you know, to pull into a track stop at four in the morning to want to get something to eat and be made aware that we weren't welcome and we couldn't stay there and we couldn't order, you know, that's, that, that that's um uh, you know it's like Grim reality yeah yeah it, it it is so there were you know a few of those kind of moments with with foots and and it was great but you know i remember marshall and peewee on the bus one time you know peewee was such a character marshall was such a character i used to call marshall from time to time and really miss him when he's gone because he was he was a character you know i'm the type of person that if i know you and I have your number from time to time, I'm going to call you just, just because, you know, social media is wonderful, text, email, all wonderful things. But sometimes I just have to hear you. And we That's need great. To laugh. It's not and enough we, of that. Not enough. And, yeah. and we need to laugh, you know, I mean, I, I call Keith Harrison and talk about when it was four in the morning and we were in Memphis and went to the restaurant and had a big stack of, 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 of pancakes you know and and we'll just laugh till it hurts you know and uh um you know peewee and marshall used to always accuse me of being overly funky you know and it's <laughs> like well okay you know it, it is what it is but again everything that i have through the funk is a reflection of what i learned from the grand masters, you know, if you couldn't learn from Junie, if you couldn't learn from Bootsy, if you couldn't learn from Bernie, you couldn't learn from Roger, you couldn't learn from uh, Dr. Yasha Barjona, if you couldn't learn from, from you know, firsthand. I mean, and, and, and I guess that was the beauty of not knowing who they were until we met, you know, they, they were them and there was no pretenses and I was me and there was no pretenses. And let's go record. Let's let's record, man. Yeah, I mean, to your great credit, you were you were open to it, and you were like up for anything, you know, from what you've told me. So that really paid off for you, I think. Well, what, what's the worst that can happen? You know, <laughs> you erase it and do something different. You know, um, uh, I have a good friend. I I describe him as you know, that I've used on all my other projects and TV cues that I describe as if I had a twin brother that played guitar, his name is Kerry Marks. And Kerry Marks is from Nashville, Tennessee. And he's the music director at the Grand Ole Opry. And he's been play, a player on the Grand Ole Opry for a million years, but he plays a zillion different styles. And, and one day we're recording something or other. And uh, he said, yeah, we've got a, I think he was like, I like what you're trying to do. You know, you're, 
you're trying to play a part and it's like well i like what you're trying to do it doesn't mean you've done it that's you, faint you praise a left-handed yeah, compliment you, yeah yeah you you haven't done it yet but i like what you're trying to do and if you and if you can do what you're trying to do we'll be somewhere but good I thought like you, yeah yeah I, <laughs> I like what you're trying to do you know yeah that's funny Wow, Wes, I uh, appreciate all these stories. So cool that you were there, you know, sort of a fly in the wall for a while and then became immersed in part of it. Well, it was sure fun being, a, you know, I, I thank Diamond, you know. <laughs> Diamond was the one that actually busted me, you know, and I, and uh, he's one of the ones that I still call from time to time because just, just have to do it, you know, and uh, we'll sit and laugh about things. I'm so glad he's still out there. They're still doing it, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Probably, maybe, certainly one of my favorite drummers of all time. Diamond. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So is there anything that, um, you know, while I got you, do you like to plug for the viewers or listeners uh, to look out for or any projects? Well, you know, um, Hip Hop Lollipop, the video by Bootsy, look, look for it, you know, you can find it on YouTube. And the, pow uh, the Power of, of the One, the album from two years ago, has some great stuff on it. I lo love to, to plug the living daylights out of that. And uh, yeah, Hip Hop Lollipop is really a lot of fun. Victor Wooten uh, just does profoundly wonderful bass work on that uh so you know look at the video on youtube and bootsy you know is him is is himself which is always spectacular and, and victor is just wonderful and it, it's a it's a it's a really fun track and a cute little video so check out both the album and that one piece that was a derivative of club funketeers Amen. That album helped myself and thousands get through the pandemic a little better, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it was a fun, a fun, fun, fun project. All right. Well, it's been yeah. so much fun talking to you and getting these stories. And I just want to personally thank you for, for the music and your contributions. Well, Hey, you know, uh, uh, it was an honor and a privilege and a, a blessing and a true gift to have even got to walk through the door on one of those, let alone all of those, you know, they were really special moments. They really are. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkinstuff.net, buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon, shopping at the Funky Things store, for cool merchandise at funkinstuff.net and linking through funkinstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven results-oriented professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the media services section at funkinstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkinstuff.net I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on keep vibing, on vibing to the rhythm of the one.